that uh, some people have pointed out to me. So if A is a, so in zero sum game, A is a cost matrix for player one, then the saddle point equilibrium is P star Q star is S P E if and only if, now I have to be careful, P star transpose A Q star is less than equal to P transpose A Q star is less than equal to P star transpose A Q for all P in delta M, Q in delta N. A is a matrix in R M cross N, okay? So if you have noted something different in one of the previous lectures, it's likely to be my fault and so please correct it in your notes if you have written something like this. Uh, I, I mean if you have written anything different here than what's there on the board, okay? The other thing I wanted to discuss is for some people, either fictitious play is not, no, fictitious play is converging but, but P star minus P hat T may not be converging. How many of you are in this situation? No one? Mine converges initially and then maybe grows a little then like the, the lowest, the, the, the minimum of P star minus P hat is not necessarily at iteration like 10,000. Um, but if you run a million or 10, or 10 million iterations, then it converges. Yeah, there might be a few oscillations in the first 10,000, but it should be around zero. Out, like yeah. Zero. So, yeah, this should converge to zero. But if it is not converging to zero, it's likely that the random zero sum game that you have, you have initialized has a two or three or maybe multiple saddle point equilibrium, okay? So it might just be, the linear programming solution might be giving you a different saddle point equilibrium than what P hat T is giving you, but the value has to be the same, okay? Because the value doesn't depend on which saddle point equilibrium you choose. And this is something you will prove in the second assignment. Uh, so the value of a zero sum game remains the same no matter what saddle point equilibrium you choose to play with. Okay, so this, if it is not converging to zero, don't be alarmed. It just means that your game, the game, particular instance of the game has multiple saddle point equilibrium. Okay. Okay, uh, any other questions about the homework? No, everything is working out fine. Good. Uh, so let's start our discussion about Kuhn's theorem. And we wanted to prove Kuhn's theorem, by the way, how many of you have heard of KKT condition? Okay, a lot of people have heard. So the second K in KKT is Kun. Okay, it's the same Kun as this Kun. And who is who is the T part? Who is who is Tucker? Who is he? I mean, what's his designation? He's a advisor. He's a PhD advisor of John Nash. Okay, so so this class is very intimately connected to uh, the EC five seven five nine. Uh, the class on optimization. Okay. It, it turns out many of uh, Tucker's students have won several awards, like top awards, like Nobel Prize and stuff, uh, including John Nash, so that's really amazing. I wish I could be a PhD advisor like that. So Joe, <laughs> Joe Balsam, Johnny, you know, the... <laughs> Okay, uh, so what is, uh, let me set up the game, uh, perfect recall, anyone remembers what the definition of games with perfect recall is? No one forgets the past, okay? So player I, uh, so let, let me define HIT as the history or information 
of player i at time t and a i t is action of player i at time t okay and a perfect recall is defined as h i t is a subset of h i s for t less than equal to s and a i t is a subset of h i s for t less than equal to s okay so that's a game of perfect recall and this is the notation that i'll be using throughout this class throughout this lecture so what would be a rigorous definition of a mixed strategy so a mixed strategy is this is for an arbitrary game it so turns out by the way that this would imply that h i t plus 1 is some deterministic function of h i t and a i t okay so mixed strategy m of player i at time t is m i t which maps a set omega cross the information so let me denote the information by script h h i t to the action space a i t okay so omega is the is the set of all uncertainties okay you can without loss of generality you can take it as 0 1 closed interval 0 1 with uniform probability distribution so omega without loss of generality omega is 0 1 with uniform distribution okay i'm going to be a bit uh, i'm not going to be using the precise mathematical notation this time uh, so as to not make it very cumbersome to understand what the basic idea of kohn's theorem is and that's mixed strategy and behavioral strategy so b i t i'm going to define m i as the collection m i 1 m i capital t behavioral strategy b i t is b i 1 b i capital t is a behavioral strategy if bi is mixed is a mixed strategy such that b i t and or b i t a i t given h i t or and b i t b i s are independent
for p not equal to s. Okay, so this definition of behavioral strategies is uh, slightly different <coughs> from what we had. I mean, it's not different actually. I mean, in spirit, it's the same as what we did in the previous class. Uh, but the way we define it for the purpose of this class is as a subset of mixed strategy. <coughs> okay, so remember that that if you define a function f from omega cross x to y where omega is a is a 0 1 uh, I mean omega is set 0 1 with uniform distribution this is same as uh, having a function that having a conditional distribution that gives y given x okay these two are same things and that's the notation i'm using here is that clear is this is this point clear okay any conditional distribution can be written in this form any such function can be written as a conditional distribution okay as long as omega is a random variable uh, 0, 1 with uniform distribution. It can be any other set as well. It could be a Gaussian distribution over the entire real line or whatever. Uh, not, not. This is sufficiently general. And every conditional distribution can be written in this as a function form. Every function of this form can be written as a conditional distribution. Okay, there is a bijection between the way you write this class of distribution or conditional distribution. Is that clear? Question? Mixed strategy. So in mixed strategy, I have this omega, which I am going to sample from this uniform distribution at the first time instant, right? And at every point of time, I'm going to look at HIT, what the history is, and I'm going to use that original, uh, uh, original uh, uh, realization that I sampled before the game started. Okay, so you sample it before the game starts and you are go going to use the same omega throughout all time steps. Okay, whereas in behavioral strategy, the difference is you assume that this probability distribution and this probability distributions are independent of each other. Depends on the real realization of the game, but here I maybe put, uh, suggest uh, uh, non-real uh, realization, right? You mean real time or non-real time? No. Realization of four omegas. So in this case, so so there is a conceptual difference and there is a real difference in real life. Okay, so the conceptual difference is. In this case, your actions across time are correlated because you have used the same sample to generate those actions. Okay? In this case, the actions are uncorrelated. They are independent of each other by the nature of the distribution. So even though I have introduced behavioral strategy as a subset of mixed strategy, the way you define it is such that the actions become uncorrelated in which case, practically speaking, you can generate a new sample every time you have to make a decision. Practically. Mathematically, there is no difference whatsoever. Except the fact that this distribution is independent of this distribution. Okay, the way you have defined it. Okay. So is this point clear to everyone? Okay, because I'm going to make use of this fact uh, in the proof. Okay. 
So what is Kuhn's theorem? I want to write Kuhn's theorem on the board. Uh, so if M, so okay, define M bar as M1, Mn. So there are n players. Okay, this is my m bar, and let's say I have two m1 bar and m2 bar are two different uh, set of mixed strategies of all n players. So we say that they are equivalent. if the probability distribution of H I S is equal to or H I T for all I for all T yeah So we say that two mixed strategies are equivalent if they produce the same distribution over the information set that the players have. What does this uh, imply? Sorry? Yes, so actions will be taken with equal probability, right? Under this, uh, well, it, yeah, I mean, uh, remember HIT contains the action, so of course actions will have to be of equal probability because the entire history has same probability. But it's not necessarily what, uh, what you say. So if you look at, so here is what this means. You start a game, you define some information structure, Okay, you have you have you have showed this game in extensive form. Uh, you have defined what the information structure is. What I'm saying is, if M1, which is a set of mixed strategies of n players, and M2, which is another set of mixed strategies of n players, they are said to be equivalent if the probability distribution of reaching each of these nodes are the same. Okay. But this is slightly more general. What it says is the probability distribution of reaching these nodes are the same, and probability distribution of reaching these nodes are the same, and so on. OK? So that's the meaning of equivalent strategies. So two mixed strategies are equivalent if they span the same, uh, the same distribution over the history of uh, at all time steps. So what is uh, Kuhn's theorem? Anyone remembers Kuhn's theorem from the previous lecture? Can someone recall what Kuhn's theorem is? So now that becomes clear, right? Every mixed strategy, for any mixed strategy that I give you of n players, you can define a set of behavioral strategy, right? Where these two become uncorrelated. You can define a set of behavioral strategies that span the same probability distribution at each of these nodes okay and therefore it will yield the same payoff uh, for each of those players okay Kuhn's theorem, fix m minus i. All of you know what m minus i is? OK, so I, I define m minus i as m1, 
एम आई माइनस वन एम आई प्लस वन एम कैपिटल एन ओके सो आई एम रिमूविंग द स्ट्रैटेजी ऑफ द आयथ प्लेयर सो फिक्स एम माइनस आई फॉर एवरी एम आई देर एग्जिस्ट बी आई सच दैट probability under m of h i t is equal to probability under b of h i t for all t i haven't defined b right so b would be m1 एम आई माइनस वन बी आई एम आई प्लस वन एम कैपिटल एन ओके सो आई एम रिप्लेसिंग आई एथ पर्सन मिक्स स्ट्रैटेजी विथ अ बिहेवियरल स्ट्रैटेजी सो इंस्टेड ऑफ रैंडमाइजिंग एट द वेरी बिगनिंग ऑफ द गेम यू कैन नाउ रैंडमाइज एज टाइम प्रोग्रेस यू डोंट हैव टू रैंडमाइज एवरीथिंग एट द वेरी बिगनिंग and so the proof for this is i am going to define bit of ait given hit as probability under the mixed strategy a it hit over probability under the mixed distribution hit if is strictly positive oh you can uh, oh if pm of hit is equal to 0 you can define it any way you want so bit एच आई टी आर्बिट्ररीली डिफाइन इफ इज इक्वल टू जीरो ओके सो इफ यू आर नॉट एक्सपेक्टिंग दैट यू विल बी एट सम नोट ड्यूरिंग द कोर्स ऑफ द प्ले बिकॉज ऑफ द चॉइस ऑफ स्ट्रैटेजीज देन यू कैन डिफाइन द बिहेवियरल स्ट्रैटेजी एट दैट नोट एनी वे यू वॉन्ट Okay, and I'm going to delete this side. So, how should we go about proving the result? Any thoughts? How should we prove that this holds true for every time t? sorry induction right that's the easiest way to prove such things which works for all time steps or for all n so proof by induction so this is my candidate behavioral strategy and now so one thing i want to note here is that i am defining the behavioral this conditional distribution in a specific manner but that doesn't mean that i am making this conditional distribution dependent on each other okay so you can have remember this is mixed strategy so it means that the random variables are across time are dependent on each other because you are using the same omega for generating action at every point of time but the way i have defined this behavioral strategy i am making it independent across time okay to to give you an example i mean not an example of this but if x is uniform 
0, 1 and x equal to y, then y also becomes uniform 0, 1. Right? But x and y are correlated. Right? They are equal to each other. What I am saying is, well, I am defining another variable y, which has the same distribution as x, but it's completely uncorrelated. It's independent of x. Okay? So that's what I am trying to do here. You, I have a distribution of some variable, okay, and I'm removing that dependence completely. I'm erasing this part completely by defining this behavioral strategy. I'm removing the dependence across time. I'm making them independent of, of, uh, so each action, uh, I mean, actions across time are completely uncorrelated by defining it this way, okay? But I still need to prove that the probability distribution of each, uh, each information set has to be the same as probability distribution under this behavioral strategy. So let's, uh, t equals to 1 uh, is obvious because there is no history whatsoever. Assume that it works for so one obvious, uh, so what this means that probability of M H I 1 equals to probability under B H I 1 because the there is no history at the first, I mean the history is pretty, uh, it's uh, not correlated across, correlated due to the action. At the first time step, the player has to take the first action, so it's, there's no correlation whatsoever. Uh, assume uh, the claim holds for time s. So let's define PB of H I S plus one. What is this equal to? It's PB H I S plus one given H I S and A I S into probability of AIS given HIS, this is also dependent on B into probability of HIS with respect to B. Okay, is this, is this part clear? I also want to recall that HI T plus 1 is some function of HIT and AIT, okay? This function depends on the information structure of the game, the extensive form of the game, okay? It's independent of everyone else's strategy. It's independent of everything else that's happening in the game, okay? That function doesn't depend on anything else except for how you define the information within the game, okay? So at this point of time, I want to pause and I want to ask for any confusion or questions you may have at this moment. Is everything clear until this time? Okay. So this is, what is this equal to? It's one of FIS, HIS, AIS of HIS plus one. All of you know what this symbol is, right? It's an indicator function. So if this is equal to this, then it's fine. It's equal to one. If this is not equal to this, then it's equal to zero, okay? What is PB of AIS given HIS? What is this quantity equal to? Right, this is PB AIT given HIT. Okay, so that is equal to PM AIT 
H I T over P M H I T multiplied by P P B H I S. What is P B H I S? Remember the claim holds for time s. So P B H I S is equal to P M H I S. What is missing? Sorry. Oh s. Thank you. S. This gets cancelled with this. And what I have is P M H I S plus one. Okay. Of course, I'm assuming that under the strategy B, HI of S is receiving a positive probability. If you act according to B, if everyone acts according to B, HI of, HI of S is reached with probability, with a positive, strictly positive probability. Okay. For other cases, you can divide it into two separate cases, but you know how to fill in the blanks. Okay. So that's the result of Kuhn's theorem. Fairly straightforward. But it's quite, quite powerful because what that means is in any game of perfect recall, there always exists an equilibrium in behavioral strategy. So this is an implication. This is a corollary of this particular result. Any questions so far on this? OK. So what's the corollary? The corollary is. In every finite game in extensive form with perfect recall, there exists a Nash equilibrium in behavioral strategy. Any idea how do we prove this corollary? How do we prove this corollary? This is Kuhn's theorem. How do we prove this corollary? Yeah? Right. So you define the normal form of the game, you get a strategy, you get a solution in mixed strategy. And then because each player's mixed strategy is equivalent to a behavioral strategy, what you do is you fix the strategies of player two to n, you come up with a behavioral strategy for player one, then you do the same thing for player two, fix the behavioral strategy of player one and fix m3 to mn, and then define the behavioral strategy for player two and so on, keep going on. And you will go all the way up to n, player n, and you will have a Nash equilibrium in behavioral strategy because they give you the same payoff, right, as the mixed strategy. Okay, so that's a fairly, uh, fairly uh, nice result uh, because many games have perfect recall property, right? You remember what you remembered yesterday. And you remember what you did yesterday. Right? That's all you need to have. And that, that's supposed to be true for each player. OK, any question? No? OK, so now I want to talk about correlated equilibrium and coarse correlated equilibrium. That's the next topic uh, that we want to discuss.
and I want to motivate the topic with the following example. There are two players, player one and player two. They are standing at a traffic light and the payoff matrices are given by, so P1 has a stop, go, P2's actions are stop and go. And the payoffs are if both of them are stopped, it's zero, zero. If one of them stops, it's zero, one. And one, zero. Both of them go, there is a crash, and they face a very high penalty. So this is the payoff matrix. What are the Nash equilibrium here? So there are two pure strategy Nash equilibrium. What are those equilibrium? PSNE, pure strategy Nash equilibrium. What are the pure strategies Nash equilibrium? Go stop. So first player goes all the time and the second player stops all the time. The other one is stop go. So the first player stops all the time, second player goes all the time. And there is a mixed strategy, Nash equilibrium, which is quite funny actually. It's with probability 100 over 101, you stop. And with probability 1 over 101, you go. Okay, and same thing for the other player. Okay, those are the two mixed strategy Nash, I mean that's the mixed strategy Nash equilibrium in this particular game. So suppose you are uh, you are an official and you have to design this traffic light which is going to stop the traffic of one road all the time right it's not useful it's not fair to the people who are coming from that road so this equilibrium is ruled out the other equilibrium is also ruled out and this equilibrium is also ruled out because there will always be a crash every day every moment there will be a crash not every moment but uh, many a times during the day there will be a crash, right? So you don't want that to happen. What would be an ideal scenario? What would be an ideal solution to this particular problem? Right of way. Right of, right of way uh, doesn't work for all intersections. Uh, can someone else give it a shot? What would you do in this case? Without changing the, I mean, you can't change the payoffs, yeah. Yeah. I think uh, the game being static has uh, a good option. So maybe we can find a dynamic game in which one player would know uh, the other player's action ahead of time. Okay. And this would change. This would change. So you want to change it into a, a dynamic game, yeah. right? Let me, I mean, the idea is very, very simple. I mean, your idea is close, but not there yet. Okay, so what I'm going to do is put a signaling device, which is the traffic lights, so that it will either signal the players to play this equilibrium, or it will signal the player to play this equilibrium. Okay, so what this signaling device is doing, it's correlating the actions of the two players. Okay, and that's known as 
correlated equilibrium okay so we say that r which is a distribution over the set m cross n so remember delta equal to set of probability distributions over 1 m 1 n okay so you can think of delta m cross n or r as a matrix r as as a matrix or r as a function of i and j that tells you what the probability if uh, correlating the action i of player 1 and action j of player 2 is so that's a correlated equilibrium so we no uh, that's r i want to say that the game is m n a b that's my game so m actions of player 1 n actions of player 2 and this is cost matrices okay It, here they are payoff matrices okay but i'm considering cost matrices here you can switch the inequalities for payoff matrices uh so r is a correlated equilibrium if and only if summation aij j equals 1 to n is less than equal to summation ai prime j rij for all i prime in 1 to n and the same inequality would hold for player 2 so i'll write it here summation i equals 1 to m b i j r i j is less than equal to summation i equals 1 to m b i j prime r i j for all j prime in 1 to n okay so that's so the reason why i write it in this form is uh, is is pretty straightforward is it easy to find correlated equilibrium all a all that a correlated equilibrium has to satisfy are these m inequalities and these n inequalities right that's the only requirement on correlated equilibrium so is it easy to compute correlated equilibrium of a game of a finite game i mean you just have to find a feasible point in this set r so you can have any objective function it doesn't matter you just have to find a feasible point r 
that satisfies these n set of inequalities. So it essentially is a linear program, okay, with any arbitrary objective function. You don't have to pick a specific objective function. And it's a, just a linear program, and you can solve it in finite time, and you can get the result. Uh, it's fairly easy, straightforward. And this idea was proposed back in 1974, 1974 by Aumann, who went on to receive Nobel Prize in, uh, I think in 2005, no, maybe not 2005, he got it in 1993 or 94 along with John Nash. Okay, so the very powerful idea, the idea is in a game, if there are some outcomes that are highly desirable to both the parties, it's good to have an independent authority coordinate their actions so that they don't get into these ugly situations. Okay? So if you remember in the battle of the sexes game, you remember there were these two actions or two outcomes which had zero payoff for both the players. Right? Uh, in the battle of the sexes. So this is the traffic traffic in the battle of the sexes. The payoff matrix this was cons concert and this was football and the same thing here concert and football and the Payoff was 2, 1, 0, 0, 1, 2, right? All of you remember these payoff matrix, right? If these players get into an agreement that what we do is let's toss a coin. If it heads, we go to concert together. If it's tail, we go to football match together, right? So they are always on this good portion of the game, and they'll never have a bad outcome in this particular game as long as they are willing to sign that contract. Right? Same thing here, in the traffic light, what the, cor what the correlated equilibrium turns out to be one half of this. Uh, so what the traffic light will do, for half the time it's going to stop player one from moving and it will allow player two to go and for other half of the time it will stop player two to go. It will stop player two and allow player one to go. Okay. So that's the, that's the equilibrium. So it avoids this point and it avoids this point, okay, which are the bad outcomes. And it always remains within the good outcome zone. But the question that we really should ask, what if I violate whatever has been recommended to me? So if this signaling device has given me a red light, which essentially means I should stop, why should I really stop? Why can't I just go in that particular situation? So, sorry? You're worse off, you know, due to this inequality. And so let's rewrite it. I'm going to def divide it by R, R i, which is the marginal distribution of playing i, R i. And what I have is expected cost with respect to distribution R of the cost of player 1, player 2 given A1 star is less than equal to expected value under the distribution R of so C, C1 and C1 of A1, A1 tilde, A2 given A1 star. Okay, so it's the same thing. Same thing as this one. Now I am replacing the matrix as a cost function. So C1 is the cost function of player 1. Uh, given player 1 acts according to A1 star and player 2 acts according to A2, and then I'm taking the expectation with respect to R. Okay, and this is a conditional expectation which is the same thing here, okay? This is the marginal over i. So these two formulations are the same. This is written 
in terms of linear inequalities, this is written in terms of conditional expectation. So what is happening here, the signaling device told player 1 to act according to A1 star. So player 1 says, well, the signaling device has asked me to play according to A1 star, so let me form the conditional expectation of what the cost, expected cost to me is going to look like, okay, under the recommended action and under some other action that I can take, potentially. Okay, so I'm not going to play according to A1 star, I'm going to act according to A1 tilde. And it turns out the expected cost is lower if you follow the recommendation, and if you don't follow the recommendation, the expected cost increases. Okay, so by introducing this correlation device, what I have done is induce the players to make the right choices for everyone. Okay, that's correlated equilibrium. The same set of inequalities would hold for player two if I divide it by Rj and divide it by Rj. So that becomes a conditional expectation uh, with A1 star re replaced with A2 star and so on. Okay, is that is that clear? So correlation is good in, in real life. You know, it, it Make sure that you don't, the two players don't behave in a, in an, in a way that, that comes up with a bad option for both the players. What you will show in assignment two is that the set of correlated equilibrium is a closed and convex set of delta m cross n. That's another interesting feature of correlated equilibrium. Okay, now I want to define any question on correlated equilibrium. Okay, so in, in the traffic game, the correlated equilibrium is R stop comma go equals half equals R go comma stop and all other R's are zero. R stop stop equal to zero. R go go equal to zero. And so both players have a payoff of one half in this game with correlated equilibrium. And with mixed strategy Nash equilibrium, they had a payoff of zero. So correlated equilibrium improved their expected payoff by correlating their actions. Okay, any questions so far on correlated equilibrium? So let's study coarse correlated equilibrium. Remember that the correlation device has to be a third party device. It can't be controlled by individual players. It has to be a third party device. So in coarse correlated equilibrium, the you don't have this conditioning, okay? So the equilibrium is R in delta M cross N is coarse correlated equilibrium if and only if expected value with respect to R of C AI a minus i or c i a i a minus i is less than equal to expected value of with respect to r c i a i tilde a minus i
So what's the difference between coarse correlated and correlated? So in real life, try to imagine what's the difference between this set of inequalities and this set of inequalities. By the way, this should hold for all A tilde I in the action set of player I and this should also hold for every A tilde 1 in the action set of player 1 and for all I. Okay, I, you know I'm writing it as two player but you know it, it works in general n player case also without any loss of uh, generality. I just don't want the notations to be cumbersome on the board. Uh, I'm lazy. Uh, okay, so what's the difference between coarse correlated and correlated equilibrium? So in correlated equilibrium, you are told an option and you are still, you still have to decide whether you want to play that action or you want to switch your action. It just so turns out that switching an action is bad for you, right, in the conditioned sense. In course correlated equilibrium, you have signed a contract that you will always play the action that you have been told. Okay, and in expectation, your expected cost is less than equal to if you choose your own action from the very beginning. Okay, you're not told what action you should play. So in expectation, even before you are told, in this case, in correlated equilibrium, you are told what to do. In this case, you're not told what told what to do, you have already signed a contract that you will do what you will be asked to do. Okay? You don't have the choice. You have the choice whether you want to play the game or not, but once you say that you want to play the game, you don't have the choice of switching your action as is the case here. Okay? That's the difference between course correlated equilibrium. And And it so happens that in course correlated equilibrium, you can act foolishly because you have been told to act foolishly, right? So that still becomes an equilibrium, whereas in correlated equilibrium, you don't act foolishly, okay? Because you still have the option of changing. Suppose somebody else gave you a foolish, recommended a foolish action, you won't play it because it wouldn't satisfy these set of inequalities. Whereas in this case, that's not the case. In other words, there are there are r in delta m cross n that is cce but expected value of with respect to r ci ai a minus i given ai star could be greater than expected value under R of CI, AI tilde A minus I, given AI star. Okay, is this clear, this point clear? You can act foolishly, you are allowed to act foolishly because you are in a contract to do whatever you are told. for some AI, for some, for some AI star, AI tilde. Okay, is this point clear? Okay. You know, if I, uh, you might have seen in some movie, in any language, okay, there are always movies of this kind, where, you know, there are two, 
two generals who are fighting against a common enemy and the two generals discuss that when the sun rises in the morning we are going to attack the enemy okay so they are essentially correlating their action through nature okay so as soon as the sun rises they will attack the enemy from two separate separate uh, angles so they are decentralized right they are taking they are allowed to take act they have to take action simultaneously but if one part attacks and the other party doesn't attack it becomes useless right the attack becomes useless so they use sun or nature as a correlation device right so it's it's fairly common in many day to day situations where players have to act uh, in a way that their actions become correlated and they use some third party uh, third party uh, uh, events to correlate their actions okay so that was another nobel prize winning work that we discussed in the class and now i want to say a little bit about the relationship between all these uh, equilibriums that we have studied so far so what's the relationship so i'm considering a game m n a b and i have so many equilibrium options i can have dominant strategy equilibrium i can have pure strategy nash equilibrium i can have mixed strategy nash equilibrium i can have correlated equilibrium and i can have coarse correlated equilibrium right so so many equilibrium concepts is there a relationship between them so it turns out there is so dominant strategy equilibrium is a subset of pure strategy nash equilibrium is a subset of mixed strategy nash equilibrium is a subset of correlated equilibrium is a subset of coarse correlated equilibrium okay so a generic game may not have dominant strategy equilibrium it may not have pure strategy nash equilibrium but because of nash's theorem it always has a mixed strategy nash equilibrium it so turns out and you will prove in assignment 2 that mixed strategy nash equilibrium falls within correlated equilibrium category in particular you can take r equals pq p r star equals to p star q star transpose right and this serves as a Uh, as one of the correlated equilibrium you can have other correlated equilibrium too but this is one of the correlated equilibrium and you will do it in assignment 2 so mixed strategy nash equilibrium is contained within the set of correlated equilibrium so what it means is a correlated equilibrium always exist in any finite game and since correlated equilibrium is a part of coarse correlated equilibrium so a coarse correlated equilibrium always exist in any finite game okay so that's how the existence result goes so since this exists therefore this exists and this exists in any finite game but this or this may not exist in finite games okay there are very special classes of game where you will have a dominant strategy or you could have a pure strategy nash equilibrium if you remember prisoner's dilemma it had a pure strategy nash equilibrium okay all right so that brings me to the end of this class any question so far we'll talk about refinements of nash equilibrium in the next class uh if there are no questions i'll question no okay so what are what is the meaning of refinement of nash equilibrium so as you have seen in the traffic light game as well as in many other games you will see that there are multiple mixed strategy nash equilibrium okay so this is a this is a property of uh, uh, of of uh, finite games that many games will have multiple nash equilibrium okay and unlike zero sum games where the value of the game doesn't depend on what the saddle point equilibrium you're going to play with 
in in non zero sum games you have to the payoff the expected payoff depends on which equilibrium you are going to play with okay so if p1 star if p1 star q1 star is a nash equilibrium and p2 star q2 star is another nash equilibrium in some sense players have to coordinate and say either we are going to play according to this nash equilibrium or we are going to play according to this nash equilibrium okay they can't interchange these equilibriums and moreover the payoff to player 1 or the cost to player 1 is different in this game as compared to in this game so in some sense there is a confusion if i have to play a game with you which strategy am i going to use this one which might be better for me or this one which might be better for the other player so the other player is tempted to use q2 star but i am tempted to use p1 star but we know that p1 star q2 star is not a nash equilibrium right so there is there is a confusion in my head which if i'm faced with this game how am i going to behave in this particular game so the idea is that you might have multiple nash equilibrium but one of the nash equilibrium will have some desirable property which will make it attractive to play that game according to that nash equilibrium okay so we will what we will do is we'll talk about three different uh, refinement that so that's called refinement of nash equilibrium so these are nash equilibrium what's the refinement of nash equilibrium based on certain desirable properties so we'll talk about proper equilibrium perfect equilibrium and persistent equilibrium all of all three of them are refinements of nash equilibrium and it so turns out that they always exist in finite games so we'll talk about them what their properties are right and and uh, may not be the probably i won't do the existence result but we'll talk about what their properties are and why they should be played in a game with uh, specific uh, specific uh, uh payoffs uh, the the one thing that i want to uh, mention is that in a game if you think about the nash equilibrium you should really think about how player 1 believes player 2 is going to play and then <coughs> player best response and the same thing for player 2 how player 2 believes player 1 is going to play and therefore he will he will use his best response So Nash equilibrium is truly an equilibrium of beliefs of how the other player is going to play and what my best response is and not necessarily a prescription of how we are going to actually play the game okay in reality you might always be using pure strategy but as long as the other person believes you are going to act according to p1 star he is always going to randomize according to q1 star and so on right so if you go out on the street and 95% of the people are good to you If you meet a random person on the street, you will assume that with probability 0.95, that person is going to be nice to me, and with probability 0.05, he is going to uh, uh, not be nice to me, or he is going to take away my wallet or my phone or something. Okay, so so that's really the Nash equilibrium should really be thought of as an equilibrium in beliefs of how the other how players are going to behave rather than. an equilibrium of how actually you should play the game okay so so there are these philosophical issues that we will not talk about but hopefully this sort of resolves some uh this builds the background for what we are going to discuss in the next class all right thank you